I've been threatening to do an episode on this topic since the beginning, and today's the day. I'm going to talk about pornography addiction, how I battle it, and how you can too. That's in this episode, 26, of Road Noise, Life, One Mile at a Time. Hello and welcome to Road Noise, Life, One Mile at a Time. This is episode number 26, and I'm your host, Michael Blackston. I am so glad you joined me this morning. On my commute to Walterboro, South Carolina, it's 6.30 in the morning, and this is going to be an episode that it could go kind of long. This probably, I'm going to imagine, is going to go more than 30 minutes. But I want you to stick with me because if you're not someone who struggles with today's topic, I guarantee you, you know someone who is struggling with today's topic, and that topic is addiction to pornography. If you've listened for very long to this podcast, I I mentioned in the very first episode, the introductory episode, that I did struggle with an addiction to pornography and that eventually I was going to have the leading to do an episode all about that, dedicated to that topic. But it hasn't been something that I felt ready to do yet for several reasons that there's no need to go into because, like I said, this episode's going to be long enough, so I really don't want to go into too many details beyond what is in this topic. And, of course, I will tell you about my week, and then I'll give you a positive review at the end of the episode as well. But right now, let's jump right into the topic on an addiction to pornography. And what I want to do is I want to do this in two separate portions. First, I want to tell you my story. And then I want to tell you how I battle my addiction to pornography and how you can too. I can consider myself an authority on this subject because I have been battling this. I'm As I record this, I'm 42 years old. I've been battling addiction to pornography since I was about 12, somewhere in that ballpark. It happened early in my life. And from those years all the way till now, it's been a constant struggle. There was a stretch of time where it wasn't that big a deal that I really didn't even consider it an addiction. At the time, I didn't realize it was an addiction, but now I do. And part of the reason was because it wasn't readily available to me. Had it been, though, now I realize I would have taken in as much as I possibly could have. So let me tell you the story of how I got started. My friend and I, who will remain nameless, one afternoon we happened to stumble upon a stack of Hustler magazines. We didn't know what this was. You know, we knew we had seen that there were dirty magazines and magazines with naked women on them, but it's not something that in our minds was, you know, wasn't on the top of our minds at that point. But we ran across this stack of Hustler magazines, opened one up, and suddenly a new world was dawning in front of our eyes. And at the, at the time, if I'm remembering this correctly, and I think I am, it wasn't as much It was sexual, but it wasn't as much enticing the way it would be to me now. Then it was a curiosity. It was more of, what in the world is this? Wow, we've never seen anything like this. So we took those magazines down to our hideout in the woods, and that's what consumed us for the next few weeks, I would say. Every time we got together and we'd go uh, play, we'd go down to our hideout in the woods and look at these magazines together in a, like I say, in a curiosity kind of way. Like, oh man, look at that, look at that. We didn't understand why, but we were drawn to it. We couldn't figure out, and we didn't know to try to figure out why we were drawn to it, but we were drawn to it. As time went by, I don't know about my friend, but for me personally, it started to consume me. 
I just wanted to see those pictures over and over again. We finally told uh, a neighborhood kid that was a few years older than us about them, and he asked for one of them. He wanted to, to have one of the magazines for himself, and we wanted to be cool, so we gave him one of them. He promptly turned around, kept his magazine, and then told my mom about the ones we had and uh, got us in trouble. To my mom's credit, she was calm about it. She understood that this was something that she was going to eventually have to deal with with a young boy anyway, so she kind of had a talk about it, explained why those things were bad, and told me to get rid of them. In fact, asked me to bring them to her, I, and she got rid of them. What she didn't realize was I kept one. Just one. But I kept it. Because I knew I would want to go back to it. And I hid it, and for a few days, I would go back and look at just that one until guilt started setting in about, I'm disobeying my mom. My mom raised me well, you know, I, I respected her, and I wanted her approval, and I didn't want to disappoint her. And she had told me how much of a disappointment it was, and I knew then that I was looking at something bad. Now, let me be right honest with you from the start. I'm coming at this from a Christian perspective. I realize that everybody who listens to this podcast is not going to necessarily be a Christian believer. I'm not coming at this to make anyone feel guilty or anyone feel shameful from my perspective. I just am trying to be honest with you, and so you need to know that I'm going to be coming at this from a Christian's perspective, but I'm also going to keep in mind that you may not be. That being said, there may be some people who listen to this episode who don't believe that pornography is as bad as it is, or as bad as I believe it to be. You may have a different opinion on it. That's fine. If that's how you feel, that's fine. That's, a, that's, that's up to you. But I am gearing this episode, and I am aiming this toward people who are in a battle, and they want to know how to win the battles. So back to the story like I said, I kept that magazine for a couple of years, uh, not for a couple of years, for a couple of weeks. And I started feeling that guilt and shame. And so one afternoon, it was in the winter, I know, because we had a fire going in the fireplace. My mom was a teacher, and my sister and I had come home on the bus, and my sister was in charge of me during that time, when the time between us getting home from the bus and my mom getting home from school. So there was a small period of time, and I went out to the shed where I had hidden my magazine, and I looked at it, and I started feeling guilty and decided I'm going to get rid of it. So I went and threw it in the fire. Unfortunately, and I guess probably for me fortunately, I didn't know how to build a fire, and there wasn't a current fire going. So I threw it in the fireplace, and I tried to start a fire, tried to burn it in the fireplace. It wouldn't burn. Could not get it to burn. That would have been fine had I been able to just shut the doors and deal with it later. But I knew my mom would be starting a fire when she got in. And my mom also smelled the smell of burning paper when she came in as well. And what she found was a half-burned magazine in the fireplace. And she came to me and said, why is this here? And I told her, I had to tell her the truth. I had to tell her I held one back, and I felt guilty about it, Mom. I had hoped that she would be a little easier on me when I told her the truth that I felt guilty about holding it back and that I wanted to burn the magazine. But she was angry. I disappointed her by withholding one, and she told me she now couldn't tell whether I was holding any other ones. She finished burning the magazine, and I can't remember what kind of punishment she doled out to me. But from that moment till way later, I really didn't think I had any kind of a problem. At that age, you don't think you have a problem. You think you're in control of everything. And I felt good about myself having felt conviction and tried to take action to make it right. So we fast forward to my teenage years. 
and I didn't have any money or any way to get my hands on this stuff. My mom didn't have it, and my stepdad didn't look at that type of thing either. I did have access to a few R-rated movies that had nudity and some things that probably should have been more than (laughs) R-rated as far as movies go because just of some of the quick content, but enough that it enticed a young man. And when I would have the opportunity, I would look at those videos. I knew exactly where those scenes were that I wanted to look at, and I would find those scenes, and uh, I was a young teenage boy. I mean, you can imagine. That started breeding my need. At that point, it was beyond the curiosity that a 12-year-old boy would be interested in and into the lust that a full-fledged teenager would be dealing with. But at the same time, it still, at that time of my life, was not readily available. I had to seek it out. I had to find it. I had to figure out a way and a time to sneak around and look at it. Then comes the Internet. And an entire world opened up to me and a thousand possibilities of being able to look at the kind of content that I wanted to look at was suddenly available to me. Not readily at first, because when the internet first came out, I was newly married, and we didn't necessarily have a computer with an internet connection, and I, you know, yeah, dial-up service. It wasn't like it is today, but it was available. And whenever I could get a chance, I found that I could find whatever I wanted on the internet. We're going to jump forward now to more recently. The internet is everywhere. Wi-Fi connections are everywhere. And I started looking at pornography every opportunity I could get. And it got to the point where you could get anything, any amount of time, for free. If you can kind of tell the pattern of what's going on here, it started small. It started with a natural curiosity of a 12-year-old boy. And every time the opportunity became more, I wanted more. I couldn't get enough. I had to hide this in my marriage behind a lie. My wife and I had had extensive conversations in the past about what would happen if she ever found out I was doing anything like looking at pornography. And I would have to lie to her and convince her. Well, I wouldn't have to convince her. She just, I, she never saw any effect or any sort of evidence of it. It didn't take much convincing. I just assured her that I was not involved in anything like that. You know, I'm a good Christian man, and I have no problems with anything like that. I would never do that to you, honey. The worse it got, the more shameful I felt. And the more shameful I felt, the more I pled with God to take it away from me. See, when I would look for this stuff, it wasn't because... I thought it was okay. I never thought it was okay. For me, in my belief system, it was absolutely an abomination. I understood that it was a natural thing for me to be interested in women with their clothes off and viewing the act of sex because I knew that men are visual creatures. I could feel, I knew the physical need, the urge for release that goes along with the an, an addiction to pornography, because if we're going to talk about this, we're just, just going to be honest, it, it's not just looking at it saying, oh, that's nice, and then turning off the uh, computer screen. There's activity that goes along with an addiction to pornography, and I don't have to explain what's going on. And it becomes that feeling, that release becomes an addiction in itself. And so the more I saw, the worse I got, the more my addiction spiraled. And at the time, at first I didn't 
realize that it was an addiction. I didn't consider it one. A lot of people don't consider it an actual addiction. A lot of people think that an addiction must become or must be from some uh, substance, some sort of uh, physical substance that they take in. That's not the case at all. Addiction is mental and physical, but it doesn't have to come from a physical substance. I realized one night in a hotel room after I had started traveling that the addiction, well, that's exactly what it was. It was an addiction. It just kind of hit me because I was battling this thing and I was struggling and praying and pleading with God to take this away from me. I don't want to do this. I don't want to look at that stuff. I don't want to betray my wife and my family. And it was a physical pain. I started physically feeling ill if I didn't get my fix. And I broke and I got my fix. I took out my iPad and I found what I wanted to find. I did what I wanted to do and I got my fix. And when it was over, I had a realization. I said, that was something I wasn't in control of. That was an addiction. My body was go. I was going through withdrawals of some sort. And from that moment on, I began searching for ways to battle it. I started with prayer. And I pled, God, take this away from me. I promised, I'll never do this again. I understand. I know this is wrong. I know what this is doing to me. I know what this is doing to my family. And I pled, and I prayed, and I begged, and I wept. And I just lifted it up to God and I couldn't understand why God when he knew I was repentant and after every episode immediately after every episode of this I felt shame I felt unworthiness I felt disgust in myself I felt weak and I would pray and I would weep and repent and just feel like this awful awful person and I couldn't understand why God was not taking this from me when I was begging him to just take this from me I wasn't wallowing in what I consider sin it wasn't me saying I'm going to do this and I'm not worried about it I was destroyed and broken each time if you battle this you know exactly what I'm talking about when the urge comes on you get numb you start making all the excuses that anyone with any sort of addiction will make justification on why this time and so many times it was gonna be the last time one more time and that's it I'm gonna do this I'm gonna get it over with and then I'm done It's just a vicious cycle. It happens over and over again. And I got tired of it. And I prayed and I wept. And I cried out to God and He just wouldn't take it away. And then one night in a hotel bathroom, because many times after I was finished with an episode, I would feel like I needed a shower. I just feel unclean and I would get in the shower and just try to make myself clean knowing good and well that I wasn't going to feel clean on the inside. And I was having one of my bouts of crying and weeping. and I felt like God said He wanted me to tell others about this. That I needed to get my grip on this. And eventually, once I got a grip on it, be able to tell others about it and help them because it was such a valley I had been through that I knew what they would be going through. But there was a step I had to take first. He wanted me to tell my wife. 
And that's an argument that went on for probably two years. Me saying, I want to I want to help people, but I can't help people if I'm still going through these battles. And I would have longer episodes where I wouldn't, and I would be strong. And I would start feeling like I was ready to help others with it, where I wouldn't be a hypocrite. And then I would have another episode. And I would cry, and I would plead, and I would pray, and I would feel unclean, and God would say, tell your wife. That's your first step. Two years later, about two years later, I imagine. I don't have the times exactly right, but it's it was about two years. It was two years ago, this coming October. It's a year and a half from as I record this. It was four o'clock in the morning. I had gone to bed with the thought on my mind to look at pornography. It something had triggered me and I was b- battling it. I was I'm going to bed, I'm going to wake up in the morning, I'll be refreshed. I'm not going to do this. I'm just going to go to bed and I laid awake with that temptation till four o'clock in the morning, could not sleep. And if you've ever lain awake at night because of something you can't get your mind off of, it will make you absolutely crazy and that's exactly what I felt like I was justifying it with is that I'm going to go crazy if I don't just go ahead and get this done. I can't get any sleep. I've got to get some sleep. So with my wife laying next to me in the bed, I grabbed my iPad. I got up. I went into the bathtub, laid down, told her I was going to soak my back because I have a bad back sometimes and soaking it in a hot bathtub is a common thing that I do to try to relieve the pain. I got into the bathtub to soak my back, and of course we knew what, you know, what I was planning on doing, what I did. It wasn't long before it was over, and there I was, praying and weeping, and crying out to God to take this away from me, take this away from me, and he kept telling me, I felt it in my heart. Tell your wife. You can't start anything you want to start as far as any sort of ministry or helping others or beating this. You're not going to be able to do it alone. I'm trying to tell you, you've got to be able to tell your wife. How are you going to tell others about this publicly if she doesn't know anyway? But frankly, she had warned me in the past she would consider that an act of adultery. And as a uh, Christian, I believe that to be. So she'd been very strong in her telling of how she would feel if she ever found out anything like that was going on. And so you can imagine, I didn't want to tell her anything. I had uh, a young son. I had a two-year-old or one-and-a-half-year-old daughter. I didn't want to bring this into our lives. But I had had this conversation with God so many times in so many hotel rooms and so many times in my own house I'm sorry God I'll never do this again please take this away from me tell your wife no I can't I can't. Finally, at 4 o'clock in the morning in October of 2014, I said, God, okay. I don't know what this is going to do for my family or to my family, to my marriage. It may utterly rip it apart, but I can't live with a lie anymore. And at 4 o'clock in the morning, I went to my wife, asked her to turn on the light, told her I had a confession to make. She'll tell you now that she was actually relieved when I told her what I had to tell her because when I said it the way I did, she said she thought I was about to tell her of some sort of an affair I'd had with another woman or 
that I was getting ready to leave her. She said the look on my face, her on my face, she knew it wasn't good, and she just it scared her with what was about to come. So she was a little bit relieved at what I told her, but at the same time, it hurt her. I said, "Honey, I've been dealing with an addiction to pornography since I was a teenager, and the entire time we've been married." And I couldn't even really get it out because I was in such turmoil. But she held me close and told me we'd get through it together. And God, I love her for that. The weight of (laughs) 20 years of lies was suddenly lifted from my shoulders and the amount of relief that I felt from that moment on I felt like I was free since that time there have been a couple of missteps a couple in the first year there were a couple and I had promised to tell her that If I ever had any missteps, I would tell her about it. And of course I didn't. I didn't want to hurt her anymore. And almost a year later, we were talking about it and how it's been crazy that it's been almost a year at that time. And she asked, have you messed up? And I couldn't lie. I mean, she'd asked me before, did you mess up? Did you have, you know, were you good? But for some reason in this conversation, I just, I was tired of lying. I didn't want to start another 20 years of lies. And I said, I've been good, but I won't lie. There were a couple of times that I messed up. And believe it or not, she was more angry then than she was when I first told her. Because now she knew about my struggle, and she still felt like I couldn't, didn't, I didn't think I could trust her. Since then, I have not messed up. Since then, I've slowly learned how to handle it, how to starve it. I once heard someone say, and I'm not sure where I heard it, but it stuck with me. If you want to kill something, starve it. If you keep feeding it even a little, even just a little bit every now and again, it will still have a little bit of life. If you want to kill it, starve it. And that stuck with me. It's a visual to me that I can go back to. So that's my story. Although I imagine I'm going to edit some pauses out. I've had a lot of pauses in this because I, I really want to think through what I'm saying to you. I want to make sure that I tell you only what you need to know but at the same time give you everything I want to give you everything about my struggle I thought it was important for you to hear all of that about my life because I want to relate to you you may be one of the small group of listeners that downloads this podcast every time I release one or you may have come through some sort of search or because you saw it shared somewhere and it said a porn addiction how I battle and how you can too and you said yeah I need that if you're here because of that I want to relate to you I need you to understand that I know what you're going through if you're seeking out listening to this podcast because you struggle and you want help and you want out and you're tired you're tired of feeling the shame you're tired of feeling the lack of self-worth. You're tired of feeling so dirty that you can't shower enough when you're done. 
And no matter how much you shower, the shame and the pain is still there because it's on the inside and you can't get there. You can't get the soap there. And so you just deal with the shame until it kind of goes away and you forget about it for a day or two or maybe an hour or two until that temptation starts coming back. And then it's all starting again, the same sick cycle. I feel for you. I want you to understand that if you're going through that, I feel for you. I know. I've shed a thousand, thousand, thousand tears over the same thing myself. And so the first thing I want to tell you now that we're past my story and we're into the second section of this, okay, how do I battle it and how you can too. The first thing I want you to understand is you are lovely, you are loved. Whatever you've done in the past is the past. When it comes to how you feel about yourself, when it comes to your self-worth, you can start fresh right now. What you did yesterday, what you did a few hours ago, what you did a few minutes ago, whatever it was, if you're feeling shame over things you've done in the past, things your eyes have seen, longed for in the past, it can be over. You can pick yourself up and say, no more. You can start fresh. Now, I realize you may, like me, have said, yeah, I know that, Michael. I've tried that. I've said that every time. Every single time I have an episode of this, I'm done. And I think, wow, okay, that's the last time. Because, like I said, you're numb. For a guy, I don't know how it is with women, although I do know that the pornography industry has a hold on women too. It used to mainly be men, but now the statistics are staggeringly balanced. Women are becoming just as addicted to pornography as men. So you may not be a man listening to this, and I want you to understand that I'm gonna try to speak in a way now that represents both men and women. Anyone who struggles with this addiction. But I can only come at you historically as a man. In fact, I want to put this out there. If you're listening to this and you're a woman and you have a story to tell, I'm going to leave my information at the end of this podcast on how to get in touch with me. I have a voicemail line and an email line. I really would love for you to contact me and tell me your story. It can be anonymous. But especially if you're a woman, I think other women need to hear that they're not the only ones. But from a guy's perspective, you may have said, I know what you're saying, Michael. I've, I've said I was going to start. And that's really the issue, isn't it? You say you're going to start fresh and then it just happens again and you feel that much weaker and that much more defeated. When it's over, for those who may be listening to this who don't understand, who's never had an addiction to pornography, afterward, the feeling of brokenness and shame, you feel like you're buried underground and can't get out. It's almost suffocating for those of us who who are having a problem with it. There are people who have an addiction to pornography who really don't care. I'll be honest with you. They don't care because they don't have a problem with it. They don't see that there's a problem with it. And if that's you, maybe you need to go to episode 25 and down. Or if there's more above this, listen to some of those. Because this really isn't for you. This is for those who want out. Maybe you know somebody who struggles with this, but just can't get your mind around why. Why would somebody want to 
why? That's disgusting. Why would anybody... You can't come at it from that mindset. You have to understand that the addicted person wants out. The addicted person doesn't want to be a slave to this stuff. But your body goes through physical needs, tells your mind that it is a physical need, and there are emotional, mental, and physical things that start happening that numb you. You don't care. It's, it's similar to someone who overeats, someone who's on a diet, who says, I really can't do this. I don't need to do this. It's not on my diet plan. It's going to mess everything up. I don't care. I'm going to go eat that pack of Little Debbie cakes. And then when you're done, oh, man. I've messed up. I've screwed up. I wish I hadn't done that. It's a similar type thing. Except most people are not going to point a finger at someone or even themselves too hard for eating a Little Debbie cake when they're on a diet. But sexual addiction beats you down. All right, Michael, so what do I need to do? Well, here's what I do. First of all, I started with confession. It was amazing, like I said, the weight that was lifted off my shoulder when I confessed this to my wife. I don't pretend to know your situation. I don't know whether your husband or your wife would understand. I don't know. You know your situation. But I know that confessing it to somebody will help. I confessed mine to a few friends before I confessed it to my wife. I had some faithful friends that I considered accountability partners that I just told them my story and asked them to pray for me, and they did. And that was huge. But I confessed it to my wife, and that was the number one thing. I also confessed it to my pastor, my associate pastor, and my Sunday school teacher. I asked them for prayer. Those are people whose job it is to keep those things quiet and private. You'll know if you have those people in your life. You'll know whether the ones in your life can be trusted with that type of information. But I guess my point is confession helps so much. Having it out there. Letting as many people as you dare to know. I pray that you will have that courage. I can't say what will happen. Every friend that I have told so far has been supportive. I've had nobody turn their back and say, well, I can't have anything to do with you anymore. And I imagine most of that is because if it's, <laughs> if statistics have anything, uh, have any truth behind them, Either they or someone they know struggles themselves with it and just hasn't had the courage to say anything. Confession has been my number one tool. And that includes confession to God through prayer. Second, accountability. I mentioned that I told people that I knew before I told my wife, I had a few friends, all of them agreed to be an accountability partner for me. They all agreed that if I was having a temptation, I could call them and they'd help talk me through it. Now that's easier said than done. I'm going to be honest with you. Anytime in the past that I've had a temptation, uh, there have been a couple of times that I've called my accountability partner. But most of the time, I didn't feel like it. When that temptation comes along, you don't feel like calling anybody. You don't want to be talked down. It's crazy, but it's true. However, having those people in your life that you have confessed to, having them there does help. It's a support system. And as a matter of fact, I still struggle with this, by the way. I'm winning my battles, but I struggle with it daily. And I was having a tough time the other day. I wanted really badly. I was on the edge of making a mistake. And I, 
it was early in the morning. I just, some imagery had already popped in my head through billboards and things that I had seen that I, I could just tell that by the, t by the end of the day, I was going to be in a hotel room and it was going to be hard if I didn't get some help. And I, I texted two of my accountability partners and said, guys, I need your help bad. I need your prayers. You know why I'm having these temptations and I don't want to screw it up. And they immediately texted back that we're praying for you right now. And they did. And that lifted it from me. It was amazing. Accountability partners, if you're struggling with this, find somebody. If, it, if, it's, uh, if it's another man, especially, I just about guarantee you he's going to tell you he's had some of the same struggles. He may not. But almost every one of them that I have told that's been a guy has told me, yeah, I've struggled with that too in the past. Third, daily attention. You can't just get up in the morning and forget about it. When I get up every morning, Personally, because I'm a Christian, I speak to God. I tell Him thank you for the day and thank you for uh, for giving me another breath of life and all the jazz that goes along with, with praying. But first thing every day, I put on my armor. For me, it's through prayer. For you, it may just be through meditation, however you do it. But you've got to keep your mind aware that you are susceptible to temptation. Every second of every minute of every hour of every day. At any time, something could pop into your mind. You could see something or it could just pop into your mind. And it triggers it. It sets it off. You've got to be aware. Stay constantly vigilant. It's... It's a ba in every battle, when you go out into battle, you go out in that field, you're always looking around you. Your head's on a swivel. You're looking in all directions, making sure that you have your sights on any enemy that is firing at you. It's not enough to say, I have a porn addiction. I'm going to try to do better. You have to actively take charge and say, I'm deflecting these things. It's a mindset. If you allow your mind to be the type of thing that, well, let the arrows come, I hope I can do it, you're going to eventually fail. You're going to fall. In another, Again, in a battle, I'm going to start referring to this now. There are going to be a lot of battle analogies, but if, if arrows are firing at you and you're not putting up a shield, eventually they're going to weaken you. You're going to get hit by so many of them. It may be one. You may be strong enough to handle two or three, four. Eventually, you're going to fall. You've got to have a shield up 360 degrees around you at all times. You've got to be aware and looking and saying, I am not only aware, but I am fighting. I'm not going to allow anything to penetrate my mental armor. You've got to be steadfast. You've got to say, you can't get to me. I'm stronger than that. Because you are. You are strong. You've got to wake up every morning with daily attention and keep it all day and know that you are strong. All these temptations are as arrows. You need to throw up your shield and deflect them. Every time a temptation comes to me now, I don't just say, ugh, and try to put my mind away from it. A lot of times we get busy and we think, oh, I'm just going to try to change my thoughts. I'm just going to try to think of something else. That's not good enough. You have to shoot an arrow back. You have to say, you have to stop and say, I recognize this. I know what it is. 
It's an arrow that's coming at me. Not only do I deflect it, but I'm shooting it back at my enemy and saying, you can't get in. I recognize what that is. I'm not an idiot. I'm not stupid. I know what you're firing at me, and I know what you're trying to do, and you can't because I'm stronger than you. That's the mindset you've got to have. It's a mindset I've, mind concept I've developed, and it works for me. Hopefully it will work for you as well. And fourth, daily intention. Third was daily attention. Fourth is daily intention. You've got to get up in the morning saying, I will not be defeated. You can't just wait on the arrows to come before you start firing back. You need to get out, get up every morning with guns blazing. Today, I win. Not, here comes the battle, I hope I can handle it. You get up, you put your feet on the ground, and you say, today, I win. I'm better than my addiction. Understand that if you have this struggle, if you have this addiction, it will always be a battle. But if you get up every morning and you say, I will win. And every time those arrows come at you, you fire right back. You deflect them and you fire back and say, I will win. Then you will win. Pornography gets us when we're weak. It finds us in our weakest moments. When we're lonely, when we're angry, when we feel less than worthy, that's when those arrows come. So you can't feel less than worthy. You can't feel weak. And you don't need to feel lonely. Because you need to know that while you're going through this, so am I. And millions, dare I say billions, of others are going through it with you. you Got to be strong all the time. It's a battle you have complete control of. Think about that for just a second. You are in complete control of the battle. You get to say whether it's won or lost. It's your decision. You are empowered. You have that capability and that power to win the battle and to tell your enemy you're defeated. And if you will do that every single time, those arrows are flying at you every single time you hear it and you feel it coming and it starts, that temptation starts needling in. You look at a billboard. For me, I, I drive all the time. I see billboards all the time. I mean, I can be triggered by anything. You're standing behind that cute little girl who's uh, wearing cut-off blue jeans so that, you know, most of her butt's hanging out below the hem. Avert your eyes, but don't just avert your eyes. You say, you can't win. I see what you're doing. You can't win. You're not stronger than me. You tell that to your enemy, to your temptation. You're not stronger than me. And you make the decision to win. And I'm, I'm here to tell you that when you do fire those arrows back and when you do defeat it the feeling of power is just as emotional it's better than the feeling of weakness that you feel when you have failed and it's right after it and you're feeling all that shame okay Michael well I'm going to try that I'm going to be proactive 
I'm going to face my enemy and I'm going to come out every morning with guns blazing, but what happens when I do fail? First of all, don't have that attitude. Don't have the when attitude. We always know it's a possibility. Always. Because you're always going to be in a battle. You know there's a possibility. But that's an if, not a when. You have to come out knowing that you're going to win. But if you do, you're asking, what do you do then? How do you handle it? You handle it the way you handle anything else. I would confess it first to somebody. I would say I, I messed up. For instance, when I did mess up a couple of times during that year, I did call my main accountability partner and said, um, Joe, his name's Joe. I said, I just need to confess that I messed up last night and, man, I'm sorry. And he prayed with me and he he felt my pain and he carried that burden with me. He helped me shoulder it. And he told me exactly what I'm about to tell you. It's over. You understand what went wrong? That's just more knowledge in your fight against the enemy. Don't mess up next time. When you fall, you pick yourself up and you continue. You stand back up and you begin marching forward. That's what you do if you fall. So to, uh, to sum up, I look at this thing as a war. My own personal war. But it's a war on my entire family. Pornography will absolutely rip a marriage apart. I really advise if you think that you have a partner that you can confess this to, that you consider it. Again, I don't know your situation. You know it better than I do. I will say that I never thought I would confess this to my wife. I never thought that I would have a marriage if I did. I thought it would completely destroy my marriage. That I would end up in divorce. As a child of divorce, that was not an option for me. However, I found my wife to be very forgiving, and she's been there every step of the way as I've battled this. Now, I ask her to pray for me. She is one of my accountability partners. When I'm feeling tempted now, a lot of times she's the one that I'll text or call, because it's usually when I'm away from her that I'm having these problems now. And I'll just say, pray for me, baby. I'm having a hard time. And she will. And she'll follow up. Say, how'd it go? Did you mess up? Did you do okay? Pornography targets your marriage. It targets your entire life. Win that war. For those of you who know someone who's struggling with pornography, I encourage you. No, I, I don't encourage you. I'm telling you have mercy on them. If someone comes to you and says, look, I'm, I'm having this trouble, or if you suspect someone is having the trouble and you're going to ask them about it or whatever, you need to do it in love and understanding and be there for them. If you can't be there for them, if all you're going to do is point a finger and tell them how bad you think they are, then don't mention it at all. Keep your mouth shut. Someone with an addiction to pornography needs your hope, your help, your support. And that's all. If you can't give that, don't give anything. I hope this helped. I hope I just didn't ramble too much. I hope I gave you hope. There is hope. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about my week and the positive review here. And then at the end, I'm going to give you ways to contact me. And I, I, really, I really please contact me if this is something you struggle with. If this is something you would like to discuss further and you have questions, if you want to confess it to me, if you want me to be an accountability partner for you, I'm here for you. So please stick around at the end of the episode to find out how you can get in touch with me.
I'm not going to go a whole lot into my week other than to tell you that I'm wanting to rebrand my blog a little bit. I'm trying to keep, you know, michaelblackston.com. I'm trying to brand myself, and I've gone into all of that and to why. But I really, when I had my blog, I named it I Write the Blogs. But really, that was kind of uh, a temporary name. It always was. I couldn't think of anything that I, I wanted to name it that, to me, rolled off the tongue, was something you could remember, and was something that had a contemporary feel to it. I wanted it to be something that was, I don't know, that just kind of had a ring to it. And I knew I would eventually find it, and when I did, I would change. And I did this week. Instead of Michael Blackston, I write the blogs. My blog is now called Funny Messy Life. And I even went and bought funnymessylife.com, so you can you can go to funnymessylife.com and it'll go right to my blog, as well as michaelblackston.com. And that's what I've been doing for most of the week is figuring out what I wanted to do. I bought a new theme uh, for my blog. I've been using a free WordPress theme, and, and it was okay, but it just didn't have really the bells and whistles that I wanted. Uh, so I bought a theme from Thrive themes.com. They've got some nice themes there and I bought it. I think I paid $50 for the theme and uh, I can use it on this website and use all of the features and I think it comes with a year of tech support if I need it. And I will say it has taken a bit of a learning curve for me to get ready. I'm having to learn how to do certain little things it doesn't it's not as easy as the drag and drop builders like wix.com and all that that i spoke of in the last couple of episodes it's not a drag and drop so you have to do some things it's it's pretty much set up the way it's going to be and if you want to change some of the physical aspects you have to kind of learn how to finagle it and i've been working on that and so it's not exactly where i want it yet but it's getting there and that's pretty much consumed me this week and the positive review is about a movie I watched last night. I actually saw it in the movie theater by myself on one of my trips. And I'm, I probably won't do a whole lot of movie reviews because that's just so done. But I have a good reason for giving this a positive review. I'm giving this a positive review and telling you to go out and watch it if you want a good date night movie. Because when it first came out, I got angry when I saw the preview. And, uh... I said, I'm not going to see that movie. I was mad. Here's why. I uh, had started not do, writing a novel. I'm not, I can't even remember right now what I was titling. And I got so many projects going on that are sitting there in my idea pool, swimming around, waiting, that they get kind of mixed up. This one was a novel about a man who doesn't age. At about the age of 30, he stopped aging, and eventually he realizes it, and it's about his life going through the 1700s, 1800s, and uh, the plan was to bring him into the uh, 1900s and the things he deals with throughout those times and the loves he finds. This movie is called The Age of Adeline, and I was in the middle of writing the novel when I saw the preview, and it's about a woman who, at 29, has a wreck that something crazy and magical happens and she stops aging at about the age of 29, 30, something around that time. And it's just a really good movie. It, it stars Blake Lively and Harrison Ford. And the, the twist at the end, it, it really gets neat towards the end. But it's, you know, it's not an action-packed movie. It's more of a character study. Blake Lively plays her role. I really like the way she plays the role of Adeline because... She plays it in a very thoughtful way. I mean, the way she acts with her eyes and her voice is like a lady who has lived well over a hundred years and most of it stuck at the age of 30. The kind of wisdom and experience that would go along with that type of a life, she plays her character with that to me very well. I, I really felt for her. And, uh, and then again, like I said, the way it ends is, is, is neat. And, and, and towards the last quarter of the, the movie really gets interesting as Harrison Ford's character comes in and, and we learn all of the, uh, the climax of the movie. So I really 
suggest that if you want a good date lot date night movie you might pick up The Age of Adeline. It's just a really good movie. I liked it, and I want to give it a good review because after I finally decided to go see it, I decided I was being petty, saying I wasn't going to see a movie because it was too much like the novel I wrote. Because, to be honest, I stopped writing the novel. I stopped because I said, here we go. It's something that uh, is too close to what I'm writing, and if I finish this, people are going to say, oh, you just went to see The Age of Adeline and then wrote this novel. And I... As an artist, I'm very insecure about feeling that people might think I'm stealing uh, creativity and ideas from other places. I have decided I'm probably going to go back to that novel and finish it before it's over because I've got almost 200 pages written. And I, I really don't want to have put that much work into it just to stop. And once I saw the movie, I realized other than that aspect of it, the fact that she stopped aging at about that same age, there's nothing at all similar about the two stories so I'll continue writing that at some point it's just swimming around in the idea pool and it's not on my priority list right now so that's the episode let me give you the information that I told you about please again if you'd like to get in touch with me especially about this tender very very I hate it when I can't think of the words I want to use it's just a touchy subject please get in touch with me. Here's the number, 706-408-7456. That's 706-408-7456. Call me, leave a voicemail, and uh, it should go straight to voicemail. Leave it there. If you don't want what you have to say to go on the podcast, if you don't want your voice on the podcast, just make sure you tell me that. And I'll be glad to uh, keep it, but I will still respond. If you want to respond to me via email, the uh, email address is feedback at michaelblackston.com. That's feedback at michaelblackston.com. Please get in touch with me if you have anything at all that's on your mind, on your heart. Uh, If maybe you know somebody that you fear may be struggling with this and you're not sure how to handle it, contact me. I'll, I'll try to walk you through it if you are someone who would like to make a confession contact me. I'll try to walk you through it. I'll do the best I can to help you any way I can, but just know that I'm here for you if you need me. So until next time, thank you for sitting beside me in the passenger seat as I commute to Walterboro, South Carolina. I'm almost there. I'm not too far now as we try to live life one mile at a time.